We're looking at causal arguments in this video. And the discovery of causes is a primary basic human endeavor. We start as toddlers trying to figure out what causes one thing or another. But we also do this when we're involved in the advanced sciences. We, we formalize methods of identifying causes behind the effects that we observe. And causal arguments might include any argument that concludes by making a causal claim, X causes Y. So our content, our, our subject matter here is extremely broad, any kind of argument that does that, but we're gonna look at five different formal methods of identifying causes. So causal arguments can come in a wide variety of forms. They might be inductive generalizations or statistical syllogisms, but we're gonna look at uh, five different forms that are not cleanly in one of those uh, categories that we've talked about previously when we considered inductive arguments. The causal arguments that I'm considering here are primarily from John Stuart Mill, uh, one of the greatest probably the greatest English-speaking philosopher of the 19th century. And he formalized standards for assessing inductive arguments and their claims, especially as found in science and in causal arguments. So extremely important step that he made so that we can be better at identifying causes. The first argument form that we'll look at is the method of agreement. And so when we're seeking to discover the cause of an event or a condition, we look at the antecedent circumstances and try to identify commonality. So we see that the effect occurs on multiple occasions. We try to find what is similar preceding those occasions. So if the event occurs a number of times, and each time there is a common antecedent occurrence, well, then we have reason to think that the common preceding factor is, in fact, the cause. So if we were to structure the method of agreement a little bit more formally and consider an example, suppose we're doing a simple daily kind of activity that one might consider, uh, suppose Jared woke up with a sore neck on several different occasions, and we consider a list of antecedent circumstances for the event on various days. So we, Jared thinks back, what, what kinds of things happened before I woke up with a sore neck? And so he considers these four things, among others, maybe falling on asleep, asleep on the couch did it, maybe working more than five hours at a computer did it, maybe it was sleeping with a fan on, or maybe it was the kind of pajamas that he wore, and there are others that he considers. And on four different occasions, we have Jared waking up with sore neck, so he goes back and he thinks about the preceding antecedent circumstances that occurred on those four occasions. And if we see our list through one, one through four, we see that B is showing up in every occasion. So B is common to all four nights. None of the other factors that he considered was common to all four nights. And so we conclude that working more than five hours at a computer the day before, that's the cause of Jared's sore neck. So that's a, a simple everyday type of, of use of this method. There are clearly limitations on using the method of agreement, and we'll consider five of these. One, uh, finding a common antecedent is not always sufficient to justify a causal claim. There, there certainly were other things that were similar when Jared woke up with his sore neck that we didn't list. Uh, many of those because we recognize that they are very unlikely to have any role in causing the sore neck. But Often we're in a situation we, where we don't know that. There might be many common factors and some just have little relevance. The use of the method of agreement also does not assure that a cause will be found. It's just simply not the kind of method that can guarantee you're going to identify the cause. Uh, we have limited capacities. We, 
we may not recognize certain things. And there's no formalized way of using the method of agreement. The, with the sample we looked at, we considered that structure that's going to be common to all methods of agreement, or all arguments using this method. But our background information will always be important to decide what antecedent circumstances are relevant. So he considered things that he assumed was relevant to a sore neck, but we didn't have on the list uh, things related to what he ate, for example. And it's possible that something that he ate was related to causing inflammation and a sore neck. A couple other limitations here. The ignorance might lead us to overlooking a potential common factor that's a cause. And so uh, the one case of this was when we were investigating malaria and mosquitoes were ignored as a causal factor in the spread of malaria for years before we figured out that the disease cycle was involving mosquitoes, and so they were relevant to the spread of malaria. So it took that many years and, and kind of floundering in ignorance before we finally figured that one out. Now, sometimes an antecedent to a particular effect is merely also an effect of an underlying common cause that's actually causing both the antecedent and the effect under concern. Now, that's a general problem. We'll look at this in a different video on causation, and this is called ignoring a common cause. Let's consider a, a more formal sample case of using the method of agreement, not merely some normal activity, but a scientific discovery. So uh, fluorine helps us prevent tooth decay. Now, how did we figure that out? Well, it was found that numerous communities in the southwestern United States had a much lower rate of dental caries or cavities than other communities in the United States. So later we discovered that a significant amount of fluoride was naturally present in the water of those unique communities that had that low rate of dental caries. So it was concluded that fluoride helps prevent tooth decay. And then, of course, once we drew that conclusion based on the information, we continue to study this more, and further studies uh, confirmed that initial conclusion. The second method of finding a cause is the method of difference. When we attempt to discover a cause, of course, we need to look at the antecedent circumstances, just like we did with the method of agreement. But with the method of difference, we're, we're considering if there's a situation in which the event under investigation occurs, and we have a different situation in which it does not occur, and we look at all the antecedent conditions and they're the same, except in the situation in which the event, the effect under consideration occurs, has an antecedent circumstance that the other situation lacks, then that additional circumstance is likely the cause. So notice we're looking at cases where some cases we have the effect and some cases we do not. So that is different from the method of agreement. And when the only difference between the effect or the, the event under consideration occurring and failing to occur is the presence of a single antecedent circumstance, well, then we have reason to conclude that that circumstance is the cause. So let's consider how we might apply the method of difference. So we have one case, number one, where the effect occurs, and then we have three cases, two through four, where it does not occur, and we're looking at these antecedent circumstances, and we can see that A is present in one, but lacking in the other three, so we conclude that A is the cause of E. So for example, four mice are fed the exact same diet, they're kept in the same type of cage, the temperatures are the same, Every, all the other circumstances are the same, except one, Mickey, is given an experimental drug and the others are not. And then we see that Mickey becomes nervous and agitated, so we conclude that the drug is the cause. 
Now, there are limitations on the method of difference, and many of these are the same kind of limitations that we saw with the method of agreement. We'll consider five here as well. First, finding a difference among antecedents is not sufficient to justify a causal claim. Sometimes there is a connection, a correlation, but not a causation. There, there may be other differences uh, that are not relevant to the issue at hand. Second, the use of the method of difference does not assure that a cause will be found. It's just simply limited. It's, it's fallible like all inductive arguments are. Now, third, there's no formalized way of, of using the method of difference. Uh, you know, we have the structure that we already identified, but background information will always be important to decide what differences are causally relevant. With the case of the mice, certainly one of them would be further to the north, for example. Well, that's probably not causally relevant to becoming agitated, but th there are other things that we haven't considered sometimes that are relevant. A fourth limitation on the method of difference is that ignorance might lead us to overlooking a difference that might be causally significant. So maybe one is closer to a heating vent and it's getting overheated uh, when talking about the mice there and that's causing it to be agitated. You know, we, we just might consider some things. And since it's very difficult to isolate a single difference, that is when we're observing things in nature or in our everyday lives, it's often only useful to use the method of difference when we are, when we are involved in controlled experiments. And there you can monitor and control the differences that occur. And so that's when it's most helpful to use this method. The third method is to combine our first two. So we have the joint method of agreement and difference, and this would be a much stronger way of identifying a cause if you were in a situation where you could do this. So you combine those first two methods and you're looking at, at cases of agreement and cases of difference. So in several instances in which E occurs have only one common antecedent a, and there are several instances in which E does not occur, and they have nothing in common except they all lack A, then we can conclude that A is the cause of E. Again, usually controlled experiments will use this method. Why not? I mean, it's a much stronger method. So if you can set up an experiment and control the potential causes, then why not set it up in this way where you have some agreement on the one hand and some differences on the other hand? And so uh, this method is preferred. Here's an example of the joint method. Again, uh, we're, we're using an everyday kind of situation, but we would use a larger population and control more factors if this were a controlled experiment. But let's consider four people, Shabed, Ignat, Belteshar, and Norkdor, and they all work in the same office. And then we consider a couple of them got the flu, a couple of them did not get the flu. So we go back and we consider some factors about their lives that may be relevant to getting the flu. And we see that Shabed smokes a couple packs a day, drinks a large amount of alcohol daily, he never exercises, he takes a large dose of vitamin C routinely, and he does not get the flu. Suppose Ignat never smokes, occasionally drinks in small amounts, exercises daily, and takes no vitamin, and then we see that Ignat gets the flu. Now, Belteshar smokes about a pack a day, drinks moderately, doesn't exercise, but takes a large amount of vitamin C. Belteshar does not get the flu. Now, Norkdor does not smoke, does not take vitamins, doesn't get a flu shot, doesn't exercise, and Norkdor gets the flu. Now, we see uh, of those who did not get the flu, Shabed and Beltajar, there are a couple things in common. One is they both smoke. Another is they take vitamin C. 
Now, clearly with our background knowledge about smoking, we're not going to say that smoking prevents the flu. And so we can rule that one out and we conclude that massive doses of vitamin C does prevent the flu. By the way, this has no correlation to actual causes of the flu. And we could do this, I could have set it up with the flu shot being the, the significant factor in, and that would be more realistic. So that was the joint method. Now we have the method of concomitant variation. So this is our fourth method. And sometimes there's an increase or decrease in the rate of occurrence of a, a certain kind of event or the degree of strength of a certain kind of event or a condition. And we want to know what's the cause of the difference in those rates or the degree of strength. Now here, it's possible that the effect and the suspected cause may always be present to some extent. At least some rate of occurrence is there, or the, the effect is there to some degree of some sort. And this rules out the methods of agreement, difference, and then the joint method. And we often abbreviate the joint method of, of agreement and difference by just calling it the joint method. So you can't use that here because the effect and the cause are always present to some extent. Now, if the condition or event under consideration varies in the rate of occurrence or degree or the strength from one case to another, this is where the method of concomitant variation can be used. This is where it might be helpful. So using the method of concomitant variation is common when researching diseases such as many varieties of cancer. Uh, we'll take out that typo at, at post-production. Any given cancer occurs in most population groups at a certain rate. Some cancers occur in some groups at a higher rate and some in, at a lower rate. So attempts to isolate causal factors might show a relationship between a previously unknown factor and an increase in the rate of a cancer. So, uh, for example, exposure to sun and skin cancer. Now, in any given population, uh, nearly everyone is exposed to some sun, and skin cancer is going to be present in nearly any population at some rate. But the change in the strength or prevalence of the effect might be accounted for by a change in the strength or prevalence of the cause. So among those who have a much higher rate of exposure to the sun, we might find that there is a higher rate of skin cancer in that group. So the variation in the effect, it could be in direct proportion to the variation in the cause, as it would be with exposure to sun and skin cancer, or it might be in inverse relation to the cause, as it might be with, say, getting a flu shot and having the flu. And so uh, this could occur in a wide variety of cases. It is especially effective in investigating cancers and other diseases. One final method of identifying causes is the method of residues. And here you have known causes that account for much of a complex effect. So you understand something to a fairly good degree, but not entirely. Then you look for a further causal factor to explain the aspects of the effect that remain unaccounted for. Now, again, it may help to understand what we're talking about with an example. So consider this example, the discovery of Neptune. Here they were observing the orbit of Uranus and a perturbation was observed, a, a little blip that was unexpected. It was left unexplained by the gravitational effects of the sun and of the other known planets at the time. And so it was speculated that there must be an unidentified cause, an undiscovered planet that had some gravitational effect on Uranus. So it was contributing to the path and the, of the orbit that it took. And so telescopes were directed toward that suspected area 
and Neptune was discovered as a result. So we were able to account for most of the path of Uranus as it orbited the sun, but there was just a, a little factor there, a perturbation that we couldn't account for. And so we figured maybe it's something else that's causing that, and if there were a planet in a certain area, that would explain it, and that's how we discovered Neptune. So this is an interesting uh, method uh, of identifying causation, and all of these methods, again, are not uh, without flaws, uh, but they, they can be extremely useful, both in our everyday reasoning about what's going on around us and in complicated sciences like astronomy.